What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And Fabrice, what I'm fascinated uh, with, with by people who uh, invest, invest in companies, and people who uh, you know have startups are investing themselves and the companies. I remember I Yuri Adoni, the uh, author of Unstoppable Startup, and after spending 20 years in high tech, 12 years as a partner at Jerusalem Venture Partners, he wrote a book called The Unstoppable Startup. Check it out. The uh, he shows the secrets of Israel's incredible track record of success. And uh, also, I want to talk about the um, Yossi Vardy. Um, he talked about why he passed on investing in ways. And I love asking VCs. It's interesting to see, um, even with the specific selection criteria, and we're going to talk about, uh, Fabrice, your framework for important decisions and for selecting companies. We, you know, no one's perfect. We all miss things. John Medva passed on Salesforce. Like, why? And so I love to hear why he passed on these things. And before I introduce you to today's amazing guest, this episode is brought to you by Rise 25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. At Rise 25, I started, I talked to Fabrice um, in 2012, um, and he was featured on Mixergy, and I was doing work with Mixergy at the time. Now all I do is I help businesses run and launch their podcasts. That's all I do. The number one thing in my life is relationships, and I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. Podcasting is one of the best ways to profile thought leadership and companies and get their ideas out to the world. So if you have questions, you're thinking of starting a podcast in your business, uh, email us, go to rise25.com, check out more. Um, I am also going to give a shout out to Chad Rubin, who I will give credit for reconnecting us after since 2012. Chad is a founder of Scubana, which one is the most powerful operations platforms in e-commerce and helps sellers save time, money, and automate workflow. So you can check out scubana.com. Uh, Fabrice Grinda. Fabrice Grinda. I mean, um, his founding partner at FJ Labs. He's an investor with more than 600 investments around the world. They've invested in, he's invested in Alibaba Group, Airbnb, BP, FanDuel, Dropbox, so many more. And this is probably, you know, outdated uh, for Brees, but uh, they've had over 300 million investment exits. And he was a co-founder and former CEO of Auckland, Zingy, and OLX. And Auckland was one of the three largest auction websites in Europe. Zingy was a mobile media startup, which grew to $200 million in revenue. And he was named also by Forbes as the number one angel investor in 2018, measured by the number of investments and number of exits. For Brees, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. You know, that's what I was arguing. I'm like, on your podcast, and people could check out Playing With Unicorns, where you do it. My argument for you is to have some guests on, because listen, I just covered your backstory. Now we could talk about whatever we want to talk about. And um, I'm going to talk about what, how Snoop Dogg, Wu-Tang Clan, and 50 Cent relate to your entrepreneurial journey. Um, and you're laughing. And, um, but we will talk about your framework for decisions. Um, before we get into your framework, I want to go back a little bit and touch a little bit on that. So how does Snoop Dogg, Wu-Tang Clan, and 50 Cent relate to your journey as an entrepreneur? So after my first startup kind of failed, it was like uh, 2000, 2001, the internet bubble uh, 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 had exploded and it looked like tech was not going to be a thing anymore. But I wanted to be a tech entrepreneur. I wanted, I love tech. I didn't like the idea of having a boss and I, I like creating something out of nothing. And I'm like, okay, in, the internet is going to be this small thing. It doesn't look like it's going to be big anymore and probably won't make any money out of it. But frankly, it doesn't matter. I didn't get into this to make money. I just I did it because I loved it. And so I was like, okay, given the constraint of no capital being available, what type of company can I build really profitably and with very, or pro, with profits because I don't think I can raise capital and, and can be successful in 2001. And I saw that around the world, ringtones were starting to become a thing. And in the US, there was really no ringtones were available because there was no messaging, there was no carrier billing. And so I'm like, okay, it's bigger than the rest of the world. There's a reason it shouldn't be big here. Let's try to make it a thing. Now, the issue, of course, is I came here and the 
the phone companies were not interested, the music companies were not interested, and I needed to start getting the licenses for the content. And so it required creating relationships directly with artists. And, you know, it's funny, I was this like shy, introverted, 26 year old kid who never like listened to music in my life, never bought a, a CD. And all of a sudden I had to start hanging out with like Stoop and uh, Wu-Tang, you know, ODB and Fiddy and Eminem, et cetera. And, uh, but it, it was a really, you know, very, like kind of a uh, clash of cultures and, but it, it, it proved very successful for both of us. What did you say in those meetings? So you're, you're with Snoop Dogg, you're with, what do you, what do you, give me an example, like what, take me back to one of those meetings. <laughs> the, the, the problem is the, the argumentation is like, look, right now CD sales are declining because uh, A, people want to buy singles on the equivalent of Apple iTunes uh, and, and at the same time, at that time, there's massive piracy. The net, now things like Spotify have increased the music market, but at that time, that CD market and the music sales were collapsing and their revenues were collapsing. And I'm like, look, in the rest of the world, I'm seeing a trend where artists are making more money from ringtones than they are from actual music sales. And I'd, I'd like to try it in the US. I'm going to give you an, an advance and a share of the, of the revenues on a go forward basis. So the problem is most of them didn't really understand any of that. Uh, so it was more of like building enough rapport with them in order to, in order for them to trust me to be willing to do a deal, right? Like, so I think, I remember, I think Snoop wanted to sign our contract at the Girls Gone Wild party in Mardi Gras, New Orleans, you know, in the party where I think two days later he'd been on Jay Leno. He's like, ah, I have forsaken the sins of my past. I no longer take drugs and whatever, cheat on my wife. And like two days later, you know, he had like a two foot long, you know, <laughs> uh, bong that, that he was like, vaping on like ever becoming ever more incoherent i think i was like getting contact high from just sort of being around him and so but you know i think he was taking like a fun pleasure of, of like having you know me around in that type of environment but ultimately uh you know signed the contract i, th I think at some point in the middle of the night he would have signed anything <laughs> here by naming his future that's the strategy get someone to a girls going wine party get them some drugs get them the contract <laughs> <laughs> Except it was all his idea. <laughs> you know? I was just happy to get an, you know, an electronic signature or something <laughs> signed by fax, but uh, but 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 it was fun. And um, and, and even and by the way, all that was like already years into the business of like trying to get things done. I mean, at first, it would, no one would even pick up the phone. The first deal we did though was with Wu Tang. Uh, and Lad Records, and, and and also that like these guys are like hardcore. You know, you walk in their place, and there's like you know guns and like you know drugs, etc. And it's like, whoa! <laughs> I'm trying I'm to picture you in both world. of these scenarios, Fabrice. <laughs> I mean, the, we're yeah. talking if, if people don't know your background, you know, you go to Princeton. I don't know. It, it sounds like you. you didn't speak much English. I don't know, yeah. you know, and you graduate summa cum laude in your class. Yeah, so that, that's what class. we're talking about yeah. going into <laughs> these girls gone wild parties, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. And, and look, by the way, I'd, at that point in time, I'd worked a hundred hours a week, seven days a week. You know, I, I, I don't think I'd even, you know, and I was a very late bloomer when it came to like having friends, having a girlfriend, et cetera. Like I, by then I'm sure I never had a girlfriend in my life. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was too busy with like single, single minded focus of like, you know, trying to build something large. And I don't know, I, I had a sense of manifest destiny. And, and so everything else, like I put by the wayside. And, but it, I think it didn't matter. Like, I think what mattered to them was like authenticity is like, I was, I wanted, I was authentic and A, wanting to make something out of this and B, wanting them to do well. And, and despite the fundamental cultural clash and, and language differences. And, and by the way, it was my education as well, right? Like, I think um, the guys who we tang were like, look, we can't hang out with you. You're like lowering our street cred. You know, we need to redress you. <laughs> they gave me like their shirts and like, they completely changed my wardrobe and sunglasses and baggy pants and and, and it's fine. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's all fine. And, and, and you do what you need to do. How and it you, actually ended up being fun. You know, I'm curious, you know, you, there's some good, good lessons here, though. How would you build rapport, you know, two, two totally different cultures? I mean, you're from France. You've never listened to their music. Yeah. You know, how did you go in and build rapport quickly with them? 
the well originally it, it didn't go directly to the artist right like you went through either the lawyers or their their manager or their or their or their record studio or and, and so and, and by the way finding a way in took forever like the the it, it, there's no database that says who's managed by whom and et cetera, that, that it was readily accessible, but little by little, it started being known that, oh, these singers work with these songwriters who are typically represented by these lawyers. And you, we back, it, it took you two or three years before any of this started happening, but like essentially reverse engineered a database of like <laughs> music industry relationships so we could figure out and get all the copyright and, uh, and, and build these relationships. And it, the thing is that the minute you start showing up with real money, which of course I didn't have at the beginning, but once the sales started going, I mean, we went from a million in sales in 02 to five in 03 to 50 in 04 to 200 in 05. Once revenue started to become real, like for these people, like for Fiddy, we might have been as the largest source of income that year, you know, like millions in dollars in revenues. And at that point in time, I became their best friend. You know? That's a good <laughs> rapport. That's a good rapport builder, sending a million of dollars. Yes. Yeah, wait, 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 when you make people money, they like you. You know, <laughs> you know the sometimes the people I've described, you know, like my venture fund as a cult. The difference is a cult where everyone make becomes rich. You know, like, <laughs> that's true. I want to, you know, Fabrice. There's an awesome interviewer, Nardwar. I'm going to send you the interview that he does with Wu Tang Clan. Just a, okay. you know, it's, it's, it's really amazing, his interview with them and Snoop Dogg, and he's interviewed all those people. But, you know, at one point, you know, we see what you've done now. There were points in time where it was just hard for you to make payroll. And, you know, you had to eat ramen and you were on a, like a very, very tight budget and now not. And then you made a decision at a point in your life. This may have been right after we talked to just... Minute, you know, minimize everything and just go with 50 items. Um, what was important in those 50 items? So like you sold everything, you kept 50 items and then you just went in Airbnb, friends. What was essential in those 50 items? The, l l actually, let me answer the question in yeah. a slightly convoluted way. So go ahead. when I sold my company and my first, the first time I became reasonably well off was in 2004. And by that point in time, you know, we were so busy growing, they, growing so quickly. I mean, like five to 50 to 200 million revenues, like nothing changed. I sold the company for 80 million in like May or June, 20, 2004. I, I had over half the company. And so after taxes, I made like 26 million. I think I still lived in the same studio apartment for another, whatever, four years. I mean, what I bought myself that day was a tennis bo a, a tennis racket, an Xbox and a TV. Uh, and that was it. Like, and, and by the way, the most momentous point in my life at that point is actually not that day was the day we became profitable the day i no longer need to think through are we going to survive or not and i was able to pay back like the employee payroll that i had not paid in months that i was able to pay back with the debt on my credit cards etc and that was august 16 2003 that was like the most important point in in my life at that point at that point in time profitability not not the exit the thing is over time so 2012 is when I made that decision. Okay, let's let's completely scale back. Let's go down to 50 items, and 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 let's not own any assets. And and what led to that decision was frankly, at that point, I'm in my early 30s, and I've realized, or mid 30s, that I realized, you know, my friendships are changing in nature. As we're getting older, it feels that the depth of connection we I had younger because we could spend our time in college like remaking the world and thinking about ideas we we didn't have any other locations we could spend see each other multiple times a week a decrease in, in in quality like yes because these were people that i'd known forever and were my best friends i would still be friends with them but if you only see them every six weeks the the meetings become biographical updates it becomes a in the last six weeks since i've last seen you what has your husband been up to what have your kids been up to what has worked like etc but and it's not the reason we became friends in the first place it's not bad but it doesn't have it, it you're losing something and i'm like you know what when you own things especially real estate it has a tendency to own you things break things need maintenance and also you you don't you don't think through or because you have a default choice, you just do it. And you don't actually think through, okay, 
if I had all the choices available in the world, what would I really want to be doing? Where would I be going? So A, your choices are kind of preset and you don't actually think through them anymore. So you're no longer deliberate about your choices. Problem number one. Problem number two, your friendships are fraying because you're not allocating enough time to them. Uh, because, and it's not just your fault. Obviously, you're both mutually busy. And so I'm like, you know what? Maybe if I go and just couch surf for my friends' places for the next uh, few years, it'll be an amazing way to reconnect and, 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 and to hang out with them and remake the world and rehab conversations that I really long forward to or, or long, long, to have, long to have again. Now, of course, that failed but it, uh, and it led a lot of other iterations, which I could just talk about later. But to answer your, your question on the 50 items, it was very easy. I wanted everything to fit in my carry-on suitcase because I hate checking luggage and my tennis bag and my backpack. So my backpack had my electronics, which is my, no my notebook, my iPad, my Kindle, my uh, tennis bag and my tennis rackets, and then my suitcase had basically, you know, two pairs of pants, uh, five pairs of shirts, five shirts, one tennis, one pair of tennis sh shoes, one pair of black shoes, and like a couple pairs of socks, underwear and toiletries, and that basically that was it. I mean, the reality is you don't need anything else. If you have enough for business, which these days is all business casual, you know, don't have a tie or a suit or any of that stuff. I don't do black tie events. I think they're mind-numbingly boring and pointless. Um, so if you don't have any casual wear, you just need like if you have business casual and then like sports stuff, you don't need anything else. And yes, I'm I'm not necessarily cheating, but I'm counting old toiletries as one. Um, but but no, I think I'd like whatever seven pairs of socks, seven pairs of, which is like four black, three tennis or three four tennis, three black, and like seven pairs of underwear. You know that's seven. You know so you edit it all up, it's sub fifty. I mean, it's also defined, limited by definition because it has to fit in my carry-on, in my backpack, in, in my tennis bag. And so everything I own fit in that. And, and because I, I, I carry, I travel around the world with it. So I want to talk about selection criteria. I was doing research and I don't know if this is still the case, but you and your company evaluate over a hundred companies a week. Um, and so you have a certain, this will kind of, we'll talk about the framework for making decisions, but um, has this, what is the selection criteria? Has it changed since COVID? We have four key selection criteria, uh, which have sub heuristics and they haven't really changed in the last, you know, 22 years that so they keep being refined. Um, so number one, do we like the team? Number two, do we like the business? Number three, do we like the deal terms? And number four, does it meet our thesis of where the world is heading? But each of these needs more explanation because every VC in the world will tell you, I invest in extraordinary teams. The thing is, what does that mean? It can't just be, oh, I know it when I see it, you know, <laughs> like, like poor in the definition of poor. How are you going through and, 100 companies a week? It, yeah. Exactly. And so for us, it means... A team where the founder is both an extraordinary storyteller, because someone who has an amazing storytelling skills is going to be able to raise money at a higher valuation, attract better talents, get better BD deals, get more PR. But that's not enough. If that's all you have, you may end up with Theranos, or you may end up with like whatever, fab.com, yeah. hundreds of millions of revenues, but not profitable. So we also want in the same CEO founder, someone who's extremely analytical, numbers driven, thoughtful about the business they're in, understands their unit economics. And the, th and the thing is, if you only have that, you may build a small profitable business, but only a small business. So we really want both the storytelling skills and the analytical framework in mind and the Venn diagram of its section of people that have both is actually rather small. And so that actually is rather limiting. But for us, that's not enough. Even if the team is extraordinary and they have everything like the grit, the tenacity, the passion, et cetera, we want the business to be attractive. And so for us, an attractive business is one where you can build a billion dollar value, valued at least a billion dollar company. And, and by, def, by that metric, it excludes a lot of ideas that are going after, that are too small, et cetera. But number two, for us, and maybe foremost in that, is the business needs to have the potential to be profitable, which means we care deeply about unit economics. We want you to be able to recoup your customer acquisition costs after six months. We want you to 3x your customer acquisition costs after the first 18 months. Now, if you're not live yet, which happens with many of our companies, of course, we're very early stage investors, you still need to be able to articulate how much you're going to charge, what your margin is going to look like, how much, how much it's going to cost you to acquire customers, how many customers do you think you can acquire for how much, for, and you have been, you have thought it through. 
many founders have not thought through these questions and they're not right for us. By the way, some, some early stage investors will just back the team and they'll like, they'll figure it out. Um, we, we've decided, no, we also want them to have thought through where the business is going to be. And, and if their economics are not there, they need to be able to articulate why they're going to get there and how they're going to get there. And, and, and it can't require a miracle. It can't be all the stars, the multiverse need to align for this to be work. It just needs to happen normally through scale. Number three, the deal terms need to be fair in light of the size of the opportunity, the traction and the team. So there is a set of expectations of what a pre-seed round looks like in the US, right? You're raising 1 million at three to five pre, or like 750 to get a million. Like a seed round, you're raising three at like whatever, six to 12 free. I mean, pretty big range, but but at that point you're live and you're doing 30, 40 K net revenues, net, not gross. So a marketplace is doing 150 K a month in JMV, taking 20%, it's 30 K net revenues. Uh, for a series A, you're raising seven at eh, five to 10, at like 15 to 30 pre. But again, there's an expectation you're doing a hundred or 200 K in net revenues and, and so on and so forth. Cause so you need to be in line with the average of the market. And there's, if you're an amazing second time founder, or if you're getting a lot of traction, these days you can command sometimes a much higher price. Your A looks like a B. And we have chosen to have the discipline not to do those deals because you're, you're just not rewarded uh, for the downside risk. And then last but not least, we're thesis driven. And by the way, the first three are collectively required. We need to like the team, the deal terms, and the business. If any of the three are not met, we don't invest. So they're collectively required. The fourth one is, is mostly required, uh, but we're a little bit more flexible there, is does the idea meet our current thesis of where the world is and where the world is heading? And we have very specific thesis on the evolution of marketplaces, on the future of work, on the future of food, on the future of real estate, the future of lending that I come up with, frankly, through reading and interacting. And it's, um, yeah. And, and, and so it, what your idea needs to be in line with that thesis. Well, I think uh, a lot of that is cut up with COVID, right? I mean, we were talking a little bit about how COVID has changed. Maybe just talk about alcohol delivery. I mean, talk about one of the businesses you work with and what has happened since. Yes. So in a way, COVID hasn't changed our evaluation criteria. Maybe the one thing I devoid in the COVID times is investing in things directly negatively affected by COVID. So tourism, travel, offline events. And if I look at my portfolio, though, 90% is doing better because of COVID and maybe 30% is doing extraordinarily better. Um, what crises do, so t t looking at a macro perspective here, what crises do is they accelerate underlying trends. And so if you look in the 20th century, actually, the biggest increase in productivity growth in the U.S. came from the Great Depression in the 1930s because mm, Necessity is the mother of invention. If you look at the most interesting defining companies of the last decade, they were all created in the 08, 09 financial crisis. So Uber, Airbnb, Slack, WhatsApp, they all came out of that. And I suspect that the most interesting companies in the next decade either will have come of age during COVID or will have been created in the COVID area. Now, if I look at our portfolio, there's like 90% is doing better than expected, frankly, and better than was even expected on the trend. But there's like, 30% that's like completely crushing it, that like 5X. That's kind of everything in food delivery. So we're more investors in Drizzly, which is an alcohol, Uber for alcohol, if you want. And I and they 6X from February to April and continue to grow since. We were investors in Instacart. Instacart is a 5 billion a year last year grocery delivery startup. And once you reach that type of scale, 5 billion a year, you're, you, the, the type of growth rates you expect are like 50% a year, 70% a year. And even then you'd be delighted. I mean, that's at scale, that's still massive growth. They 4X to 20 billion in a year. I mean, that's insane at that level of scale. And, and so COVID has finally accelerated the, the excel, has accelerated the, the, the penetration of e-commerce, the penetration of food delivery, the penetration of uh, remote work, the penetration of, uh, online schooling and online education and the penetration of telemedicine and actually also the, the penetration of, of public online public services. Education, public services and medicine had barely started their transition to online before COVID hit. It, it, the number, in fact, it was illegal to actually have online, to have a Zoom 
doctor patient call i think a lot of like the hipaa requirements were like made these illegal but with covid now i think 25 percent of the u.s population is that a a telemedicine call i mean that's gone from zero percent to 25 percent in the, in six months is insane and so it's finally accelerated and i think frankly for the better the transition to 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 online commerce and online service delivery for many many categories Fabrice, you know, uh, obviously you are a big proponent of education and college. I'm curious of what you think this disruption is going to, what's going to happen with colleges and universities with this whole online. I mean, people now, I mean, some universities, they're just on campus, but still taking virtual classes. You know, um, what do you think is going to happen um, with the disruption of college or universities or not? The... So in the U.S., there, there's clearly been a trend. Well, so currently, of the people aged 25 or above in the U.S., about 35% of them go to college. And that's a 95%. 90% of the jobs kind of require a college degree, so it's, it's actually not a complete imbalance. The issue is, in terms of value for money, the cost of college has increased dramatically in the U.S. for over the last 40 years, much, much faster than inflation, to the point it's kind of becoming unaffordable and or leaves people with a massive debt burden, which is an issue because then they can't take risks, they can be entrepreneurial. And, and the value for money has been declining dramatically with all of the value, frankly, being captured by the colleges and not being captured by the students. And that's true, frankly, from college, colleges ranked 50 and above. And, and there are hundreds of colleges in the US. And so what I suspect will happen is the very top colleges will or still great investments and there's still great value for money, both in terms of the relationships you make and the learnings you have. So the Princeton's, Harvard, Sanford's, Columbia's of the world are still going to continue to do very well. And if you can get in, it will be amazing. And the specialty vertical learning experiences that you can get like Lambda School for like learning to code, et cetera, will also do well. But like the, and, and, and the less expensive high quality community colleges or colleges that are, just, that are just priced right will probably still be, will still do well. But the, the overpriced, you know, 100,000 year education for something that doesn't really deliver probably will, will, will a lot of those colleges will die and, and frankly it's not for the worst they're they're overpriced relative to what you get for it and i like that there's in in a way there's democratization happening with with online education because if you don't need the credentialing you, you can actually learn it kind of anything on coursera from the very best teachers in the world in k-12 can academy which is a non-for-profit is extraordinary Whatever I need to, you know, to help uh, my girlfriend's daughter with math homework, I go to Khan Academy and I just go learn the concept. And it's the quality is extraordinary. So the the amount of things you can learn online, especially if you and the reskilling that's available, is mind boggling. And 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 look, there's been beyond the fact that college education, especially in the, for the middle quality colleges, is not great. It doesn't create the skills you need for the modern workforce. I think you can complement a lot of that with what you can learn online today. I mean, clearly, and by the way, K through 12, we're also not teaching the right things. Like, I, I, it's not crazy to me that we're not, not everyone, that first of all, we're not teaching people how to, make, to do financial planning, to do their taxes, to, to, to have like- Real life skills. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, I do like a liberal arts education. Don't get me wrong. I think like, I loved like learning about the Peloponnesian War and the Roman Empire and East Asian studies and learning Mandarin, et cetera. And, and, and I think having curiosity and learning to learn is an extraordinary skill to have. And it makes for more interesting people. But I think there's no reason, especially in K through 12, like especially in like high school, teaching people the basics of like personal finance and saving and paying taxes and et cetera to me makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and, and at the very least showing people online how to learn, uh, you can learn kind of YouTube has become this extraordinary repository of learning information. Like when I want to learn a new skill, I go to YouTube and look at a million videos and I do it for everything from like improving at different components of sub components of my tennis game to, to how to create my playing with unicorns uh, live streaming show to whatever, like everything's online and available to learn if you have the curiosity for it. Talk about, you know, you mentioned something in a crisis, it accelerates things where they're already going. And I'm curious to talk maybe about um, a recent investment that your that FJ Labs made. Uh, what would be an interesting example of late? 
that came across your desk and you mm-hmm. as a company decided to actually move forward with? Uh, I'll give you a few examples uh, or one example. So I have, I have this thesis on the future of food and this thesis on the future of work and then a few these on, the, on, on marketplaces. So future of work for me is like today, most people are doing a job they don't like to do, like, or at least the job they signed up to do is only a small percentage of their time allocation. You know, so if you're a hairdresser, you want to cut hair, but you start a studio and all of a sudden you're like doing accounting and hiring people and negotiating a lease and, and like 90% of your time, you're finding for customers, you're doing online acquisition, you're answering comments and Yelp. 90% of your work becomes not the work you like to do. And, and so the future of work for me is one where people will be able to do the job they love and everything else will be done for them. Uh, in the future of food, uh, and I'm going to cross a few of these for one, idea, one specific investment we've made that I really love. Uh, in the future of food, today, very few people order food online. The reason you don't order food online is it's low quality. It's like only junk food, essentially. It's, uh, it, it often arrives late, and it's expensive. It's more expensive than if you cook it for yourself. So if you want a high-quality, healthy, organic meal, you make it yourself. But that's because the cost structure, the, the, the delivery infrastructure is high right now. It's the restaurants that are cooking the, these meals, and they have like rent and people, et cetera. But imagine a future where all the real estate that it were, the, your meals were made for delivery is in dark kitchen, so it's tiny, super efficient. They're using automation, uh, both of their processes and robots to make the meals very quickly, very inexpensively. And, and, we're, and you can have any meal you want from keto to vegan or whatever. And because of density and autonomy, you have the low delivery fees and or free delivery fees. Then I can imagine a world and it's going to take 10 years where you can have essentially infinite high quality, if you want it, a variety of foods that's cheaper to buy than to make for yourself. And that's, that's delivered to your, to your door hot in 15 minutes, right? In that world, I think over half the food is ordered online. And so that suggests that we're only at the very beginning of the food revolution. By the way, it entails a lot of changes on supply chain, infrastructure, robots, uh, dark kitchen providers, brands built on top of them, and that even the big war between Uber Eats, DoorDash, and Seamless Grubhub is only at the very beginning because it can 10x from where they are. And and, and, and number three, in, when it comes to, to marketplaces, I've been looking at, at, at a lot of models where the multi-category sites are being verticalized. And so one investment we made, which by the way, no one believed in originally, is a company called Chow Bus. Chow Bus is a Chinese food delivery company. And people were like, wait a minute, I can order Chinese food on Seamless Grubhub or Uber Eats. Why would I invest in this? Other VCs were very skeptical. The founders also didn't speak English particularly well, and you know, mostly Mandarin speakers. But they, they had a lot of insights, and they're like, "Look, the these the owners of these Chinese stores, they don't speak English either particularly well. They're they they're mostly running this pen and paper, and they want to be cooking food and 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 providing an amazing experience locally. They don't they don't want to be picking up the phone and 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 creating online websites and negotiating with Uber Eats and and answering comments in Yelp and TripAdvisor. We'll do all of that for them, and and we're gonna and they hack speak their chat. language. And, and we speak Mandarin. Well, and we'll do it in English and in Mandarin. And we'll, we'll we're going to hack WeChat, uh, not as not and technically hack, but like use WeChat as distribution channel to cater to customers who speak Mandarin who are on WeChat, not on Facebook or or, or on WhatsApp. And and they were able to grow. I mean, when we invested, and it was not that long ago. It was like a year ago. They were at seven hundred k a month. By oh. February, they were at five million a month. And I think now they were like they might be nearing 20 million a month. I mean, and, 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 and no other VC thought, Oh, this makes sense, you know, to verticalize food because they didn't, but for us, it it was really like, Oh, cross the future of work where the owners of those Chinese restaurants only really want to be cooking food and not do anything else. And we do that for them. The future of food where everyone's going to be able to order on food online. If you can find a way to make it expensive and, and, and affordable and high quality. And then like very innovative strategy at the marketing side and the company completely exploited. And so uh, it was one of our, you know, cont- not contrarian from, from our perspective, but relative to what other people thought contrarian. Now, of course, it's become, it's become standard. Like they just raised around at like a high valuation, raised lots of money. So now other people are seeing it. And by the way, we did the same thing for Slice, a pizza food ordering company, which is also absolutely crushing it. 
What? How do you spell the the first one? Chow. Uh, Chow bus. C H O W B U S. Awesome. And slice like a pizza Love slice. It. Um. So, Reese, talk about you know one of the biggest exits. And then I want to talk on the flip side, a big miss that maybe, I mean, when you're evaluating, when you're evaluating a hundred plus companies a week, you're going to miss the, I mean, for whatever reason, and maybe it doesn't fit in your yeah. criteria, but biggest uh, exits that maybe, maybe it could be biggest exit that's unexpected. That was kind of from other people's perspective, that was unexpected, not from yours. What are some, maybe a, a cool, interesting, big exit? Well, the craziest exit is one that's completely random, completely unexpected from my perspective. Uh, we, back in the, you know, we, we haven't invested too much in Turkey since Erdogan became president. And we don't invest in gaming, we invest in marketplaces. But we had this uh, new analyst who came in from Booth and he just started at FJ Labs. He's like, hey, I know this amazing team from Booth. They're building this like game studio in Turkey. You know, can we invest whatever 50K? And I'm like, you know, gaming, which we don't do because it's hit driven and it, it, it doesn't have the same network effects. It's Turkey and that's pre order going to become president. But we used to, we'd already started seeing the micro, the macro tea leaves are declining it. And their thesis was we're going to create Clash of Clans type site, types games. And, and of course, tense, um, Supercell, which is a major cash clients, by far the most successful gaming company of all times in mobile. Uh, bought for 10 billion by Tencent, uh, crushing it. And at that time, they were only in iOS and only in the West. So the thesis was we're going to make it the Clash of Clans times games for Android and emerging markets. Now, didn't take, a, I guess, a, a rocket scientist to figure out that eventually Supercell was going to launch their own games in Android and, and emerging markets. And perhaps worse, our games did okay, but none of them did really well. And so two years in, it looked like we were going to shut down the company. And it, it didn't make sense. We weren't that pro- we weren't, Nothing was, was cutting it. And so I think I'd signed the liquidation docs to close the company down. And in 24 hours, one of their engineers built this casual fun game, uh, 10, 10. It's kind of like, or three, it's kind of this math game. I don't know if you remember 2048, two, four, eight, 16. I don't know if you ever played it and mm. you had to get to 2048. Okay. So super casual math, numbers game on mobile. They built 24 hours, released it like the day before shut down the company, instant global sensation, super hit, um, got an advance from Apple, uh, so we could pay, make payroll, not shut down the company. And we're like, hey, instead of making these complex games where you need storytelling, <laughs> voiceover, like millions of development, let's just focus on building these casual games. And they became really good at making casual games, complete turnaround. The company grew to tens of millions of profits per year. Profits, not revenues, hundreds of millions of revenues. And ultimately, Zynga bought it for $250 million plus uh, uh, a big earn out, uh, and they've been crushing the earn out. And so what turned out to be a, a 50, by the way, on average, we invest like 500K. So what turned out to be a 50K investment, it's a 10th less than we usually invest. I think we got like seven or 8 million out of this. It's like 130X. A company had essentially written off, completely off core, off thesis, written and made an investment as a favor or as like a show of support to an incoming analyst. I, I, mean, compl- I mean, it goes to show better lucky than good, you know? <laughs> totally. Skill had nothing to do with this one. Better lucky uh, than good, exactly. Maybe exactly. that's, the, maybe that's the, the title of your, new, your next book. <laughs> better lucky than good. Better lucky than uh, good. I'd like to believe it's a counter example. Uh, most of what we've done, most of what we've done has been, well, uh, you know, like I just, your, I think of yeah. this from Brees, like even going back to the company that you had to continuously hustle to get payroll, there is yep. luck involved. Like you were raising $5,000 at a time to like continuously yep. get the company going. So yes, like I, it's sort of a tongue in cheek example, but there's luck involved in that. Like you Absolutely. had to like, like what, what, yeah. yeah. What if, what if I didn't make, what if I didn't find the 10 K that month, right? Yeah. Like too many months in the row. Yeah. Absolutely. You have to, you have to work your ass off, but then uh, you need to be in line with uh, the market and the history and luck. Absolutely. Yeah. And, no, 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 no. Like I think very successful people underestimate the amount of luck uh, play the role of luck in their life. Yeah. And by the way, luck at many levels, right? Luck, 
that you're born with your grit and tenacity, luck that you're born with the IQ you have, born that you, luck that you're born in this time period where the things you're interested in are, are, are actually valued, luck that your parents are, allowed you to have education and pursue the opportunities you had, luck that we're born in the West, right? Like it, my life would have been very different if I was born in Somalia. Mm -hmm. um, or as a woman in, in, in Saudi Arabia, right? Right. Like the, the opportunity, there's a lot of luck in, 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 in that goes into our lives, even though you still need to work really hard to make the most of the opportunities given to you. And, yeah. and it's that intersection of like opportunity, you know, work and luck that, 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 that leads to these extraordinary successes by day, <laughs> all are required. Yeah, so I so we'll figure out the subhead later, but I'm still going with the headline, the uh, <laughs> the title. Um, biggest misses, um, you know, I mentioned in the front of the interview. It's interesting to hear what, not just what they missed on, but why they passed on it. What were some big misses? Looking back, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, I didn't miss them, and I'll tell you two that I would not have invested in. Yeah. Uh, that would have been the biggest messes ever, and they're core to my pieces and marketplaces. So I wouldn't have invested in, in, in Airbnb because they would have come and said, look, we're doing inflatable air mattresses in people's living rooms. And I would like, that's too small an a, a, a addressable market size. And that's not that compelling. Uh, and I'm not sure I would have seen that that would could lead to other opportunities, which would be basically unlocking um, underutilized assets. And, under, and by the way, it's kind of obvious in hindsight that real estate is the highest asset class or the largest asset class there is for individual in terms of their wealth and that finding a way to monetize it made a lot of sense, but that's not the way they pitched it. Right. They didn't say this is your high. Right. If, if they pitched it that way, I think I would have gotten it. But it was, <laughs> it, it, it was pitched as like, you know, we're, we're monetizing like excess inventory in your living room or in your couch. And that didn't seem that compelling, especially with like things like couch surfing, not being able to monetize all that much. And um, Uber, I would have missed as well because it started out as a rich guy problem. Like, you know, <laughs> lots, uh, I, I, I need a better way to find a black car. And how big is that market, right? Like, and, and you needed the foresight to see that UberX and UberPool would, and that you could actually go from there to much larger markets. So they weren't offered to me, so I didn't miss them per yeah. se, but I would have missed them for sure, especially yeah. given my requirement on unit economics. Um, Give me the, an example that you make a good point, Fabrice. You know, foresight. There's probably companies that you invested in because you had a foresight. They pitched one thing and you saw something else oh, that yeah. was bigger. What, what would be an example of that? Oh yeah. So Rebag, uh, they came to me, they were called Trendly. They were, they're trying to create a second hand marketplace for, for luxury goods, but mostly focusing on dresses. And I, the, because the founder, the founder was great. Uh, he had been at HBS. He came kind of from my hometown in Nice or near Nice in France. And and he had worked at Rent the Runway. And, I, and, I, and, and clearly his work at Rent the Runway, I think, colored his lenses. He's like, right, you know, we should do the real, real kind, kind of, but for, um, except, except, except for dresses. And, and it just didn't work from an economic perspective because the average order value is like $200. The plus you needed models and you had sizing issues. So you had a lot of returns. And I said, like, look, I love you. I, I love the idea in general uh, of, uh, you know, using in, in, in general, going to resale makes sense because it's more, ecologically conscious you also make it more affordable i like luxury as a category but it can't be dresses and and actually suggested they try um i don't think i told well i told them to try a whole bunch of different products of which one of them was handbags and the company ultimately focused only on handbags and that led the average order value to go from 200 i think now it's like 1700 wow. and now the company is on 100 million run rate and profitable or getting the profitability and it came that's an insight that I had because I'd seen so many companies in adjacent categories and I knew that what he was doing wouldn't work, but I thought what he was doing in general is perspective on luxury is a great market and the having inventory in order to quality control makes sense. 
And, and if you could find it, make the economics work, and I just didn't think it would work with dresses and with that low in order, average order value. So that, that one, I think I played a pivotal role in getting him. I don't think I, I, see, I, don't think I told him specifically, do just handbags, but I told him like, find Try that something that works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last two things, if we have time. Um, so I wanted to talk about your framework for important decisions. And if we have time, I'd love to hear some of your all-time favorite books that people should recommend. We were talking about loon shots before we hit record so people could check yeah. that out. But framework for the most important decisions. You've thought this through a bit. So it feels to me that in life, there kind of is this default path that people are on. You know, you go to high school, then you go to college, then you get a job, then you get a girlfriend. Then you, I mean, not could be at the same time, but, you know, then, then you get married, then you get like two kids and a dog and, and you know, you keep going up the ranks. It's like that insurance commercial. In. Yeah, and it keeps going. Well, I don't really watch TV, so I don't know what you're talking about, but it kind of follows that that it kind of follows that path and people don't question the the societal norms. Why is it that this is the path? Why, and is it the right one for them? And I, I find that being deliberate and explicit about the, especially when you face very big decisions, and, and this could be personal, like, do I get married to this person or not? Or it could be professional, like of these two different job options that are path that are really fundamentally incompatible with each other. If I go down one, I'm closing down the door to the other. Um, which, how do you make these, evaluate these? And I created a four step framework for that, which is step one, write down kind of stream of consciousness, um, by, I guess my brain is kind of structured. A, your current, how, your current assessment of where you are in life, personally and professionally. Then two, without putting any limits in terms of what is possible, um, so don't put any constraints. It's not because you didn't study whatever uh bio you, you, it's not because you don't have a phd in, in in medicine that you 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 should present yourself from saying i want to go to biotech by the way i think you can learn anything if you really put your heart into it in kind of record time in like six months a year if that's all you do you can learn kind of anything so not putting any constraints on yourself all the things you think you would like to do and then for each of these things write down imagine yourself a day in the life of two years down, down the line. So not the ideal day, but a normal day. And, and what are the pros and cons? What do you like or not like about this? Once you're done, and for me, these emails, and I do them every couple of years, have usually been 10 to 30,000 words. And the longest one is probably 50 to 100,000 words. So, I mean, it's long because I'm, I'm, I usually lay out a lot of options. So that's step one. Step two, I then share it with the, my best friends, advisors, and, and, and people I respect to get their perspective. And I asked them for two perspectives. What would you do if you were me? And what would you do if you were you? So I get their, that perspective because usually when I ask, when asking them that allows them to frame their perspective on me. Because if I just asked them, what would you do if you were me? Often they actually would tell me what they would do if they were them. So it's good if we really put themselves in my shoes and often they still buy it, but it's still fine. And usually through the course of a conversation, like it, the information distills. Step three, and that's step most people don't take, is actually try a lot of things. Most people don't try enough things. They, they don't take enough risks. So for instance, after I talked to you in 20, 2012, um, on my list of things I, I wanted to do, I had a list on professional, pr professional, personal. My professional list, for instance, is like buy Craigslist and run Craigslist. That was one idea. Buy and, buy and or run. And I, and I had, um, and I tried that and it didn't work out. I, then I, I was like, try to run part of Cuba. So I, I pitched the Castros and letting me run a special administrative zone in Cuba. It said like a free trade zone. I was like, I'm going to run a thousand acres of the country for you, like special different rules there, um, because I thought it would be amazing. And frankly, they sucked so much from their economic perspective, but I didn't think I could fail. Now, I, I feel they were interested in free trees, though. I, I failed to convince them that so that kind of failed. I, I tried to buy eBay classifieds in 2015. That also kind of failed. Um, I, I thought about becoming an economic con commentator or public intellectual. Um, it, it's more of a job type in France than it is in the U.S., but there are a few people perhaps that can say they have, they were that in the U.S., like Neil Ferguson or Nassim Taleb or Malcolm Gladwell. The problem is the process for becoming that was like writing these 
one to 2,000 word op-eds in the New York Times, the Washington Post, et cetera, I didn't like the process. So even though I, I, I kind of liked the outcome, I realized the process was not compelling to me. That's not the way I like to write. I like to write about everything and anything on my blog without constraints. Sometimes it's short, sometimes it's long. So it, I realized it didn't work, so I didn't do that. And I kept trying these things. So actually, normally that I list all the things I wanted to do and get people through success, I tried most of them. Uh, I tried to build a gathering point for entrepreneurs and intellectuals and thought leaders and in the Dominican Republic, um, kind of a Necker Island 2.0, but not for profit. That failed as well uh, because of corruption in, in the country. And, and ultimately what I ended up doing, which is build FJ Labs, just was one of my 12 ideas or nine ideas or eight ideas, whatever I had was keep investing in companies and keep building companies. And that kind of worked. And took on a life of its own. And then people said, hey, I would like to invest with you while you're doing this. And it led to FJ Labs. But it, it, the, the, it's not as though I, I, was, I, I came up with like, let's build FJ Labs right after OLX. I actually tried all these things. Same thing with the personal lifestyle. Like I went down to 50 items. But then it was like, okay, sleeping in people's couches doesn't work because you're embedding, you're, they have not, their life is not ready to support you because they, they have to go to work and bring the kids to school, et cetera. So maybe let's go on vacation with them somewhere. And where should that be? When should it be? What structure should I take? How many people should be there? Um, then I were like, okay, maybe I should split my time. I, I like from a life, a, a personal life design perspective, I like being in, major, in a city like New York because it's intellectually, socially, and artistically intense. But I also want to disconnect because I want to be, take the time to read and write and think. And so I need to, I, I want to be in a place like Turks and Caicos where I am today to, to be reflective because if you're think, doing, you're not thinking. And so, but, but even then, what's the correct setup? Is it a week a week? Is it a two months, two months? And so I, I actually iterated and ended up with a month a month, but I didn't, I didn't end up end there. I, I didn't start there. I ended there. And so iteration and life design, you know, I, 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 they even thinking through like, would I ever want to get married? And, and I, I'm like, you know, why, why, what is the point for someone like me of the institution of marriage? And I'm like, oh, and why would I invite the state or the church or religion into a relationship when I, we can define ourselves that's in the nature of a relationship? You know, and so you can make your own, test it. And, and some things may, and that testing is something people don't do enough of in both personal and, and, and professional life. You can, you can have more advanced. And then step four once you've done the iteration and you've talked to all your friends and you've thought through what you want to do is actually take a step back and, and what are the lessons learned? What have you learned along the way? What would you do differently next time? What are the things that you're still, still require iteration um, and reflect on what has been learned along the way and, and build on it. But I think it's, it's also important to take the time to be reflective. What worked, what, why did it work? What didn't work? Like some things I tried failed, but the premise of trying them was correct. It was worth trying. It's not because you try and you fail that you should say, oh, it was wrong It could to lead try. to something else. Absolutely. Uh, I think it was fun and right to try to buy eBay and Craigslist and frankly to try to run part of Cuba. Uh, it didn't work out because it required other people's approval and they disapproved or disagreed, but it was still worth a, worth a shot. Um, let me finish on the books. So yeah, I, I know you have to most, run, but go ahead. I have to yeah. run, but I, I, don't recognize, I don't recommend most business books. I think they're boring and not that interesting. And, and look, I know I'm a super prolific reader, uh, but I, re, I read, I'd say 70% of what I read is fiction. Most of that is like science fiction, fantasy, space opera is like fun stuff. Like, you know, like Old Men's War um, by John Scalzi. Uh, in the nonfiction genre, I'd like, I'm I'm a I'm a sucker for behavioral economics and and just very specific, well, or intense global philosophy like Sapiens. You know, Sapiens is probably one of my all-time favorite books, which uh, I would recommend everyone to read. And by the way, I think Sapiens is much better than Amadeus and his subsequent books um, because I, he's a better, I think, analyzer of what what has happened in the past than predictor of the future. He's too pessimistic. I, I fundamentally disagree with his pessimistic take in the future of humanity. I'm a, I'm a profound optimist, which would be a conversation for another day. Um, and then I guess recent books I'd recommend, Lifespan by David Sinclair on how to lead a long, healthy life and increase your overall, a, 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 how do you slow down your aging if you want? Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker on how to improve the quality of your sleep. Now, of course, it's, e, 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 
he selects the data, he overstays his case, but it doesn't matter. Understanding that he overstays the case, the, 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 and most of these books overstate their cases because they, they, they kind of feel like they have to because of the pressure of publishers and to make a more compelling story. All of these things are not as nuanced as they should be. Uh, and I guess my favorite businessy like book of related, Loonshots by Safi. I mean, how both large organizations can find a way to keep innovating and how organizations that are innovating can actually find sustainable businesses, I think makes a lot of sense. And thinking through what are the what it takes to be able to be able to do that makes a lot of sense. So love Loonshots, definitely one of my favorite books of 2020. Check out FJ Labs, check out Fabrice Grinda.com, check out Playing with Unicorns. Fabrice, thank you so much. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand.